No, the chat room's dead. Um, we're trying to find a better one. Oh. So if you're watching this, yes, the chat room is dead. You can leave comments and I'll look at them, but we're looking for something better than that chat room because we just kept having... It was super expensive and it kept giving us problems. And maybe we'll do IRC. Maybe we'll use the Google chat. I don't know. But we're looking for something better. We do want you to be able to be able to chat because we want to be able to chat with you. You could probably use like a Twitter hashtag for now or something. We use Ask I More sometimes. I forgot to tweet that. I'll do that now. Where, oh, where has our Peter gone? Oh, where, oh, where can he be? You're missing iPad boxes. Am I where? Oh, they're there. I oh. have, on the other side, I have the original iPad. Well, I don't put them all there. I just have a, I try to put one of every uh, design stage. Oh. Well, all your oh, I have all the iPhone boxes there. there. They're my centerpiece. I need a, a new Mac Pro box there eventually. You have three boxes for the iPhone 4 for us. Or no, no, I guess that's two iPhone 4s. Yeah, I do have two iPhone 4s. That's weird. Probably the CDMA and then the GSM. Well, I, I have... One. They were different. Where's my original iPhone? I'm missing my all original... The, all the way to the iPhone. left, isn't it? No, that's an iPhone 3G. Oh. 3G, 3GS, 3GS, 4, 5, sorry, 5S, 5, 4S, 4. I have to find my original box. It's, it's, total, it's total BS. That's like the only one I can find, ironically. No, I'm so angry. Thank you, Allie. Just ruined it. You ruined it. Now you're not going to be able to concentrate because you're going to want to know where your original iPhone box is. It is a splinter in my mind. <laughs> Heather just found her original iPhone the other day. Did she? Had she lost it? I think it, she just put it in a, back in the box and put it somewhere and forgot it was there. And we were cleaning stuff out yesterday and found it. So I have the ads ready. I have the show ready. I'm going to tweet out the show. I should probably have the actual link that people can use to get there, because I find that handy. That's typically good. Both handy and dandy. Did you tweet it? I'm about to. I just want to put the link oh. in first. It is of less value with no link I have determined. My brilliance has determined. Oh, there's going to be a live stream? The live stream. For Apple's event. Oh, is it? I don't know. It's hard to tell. Yeah, they announced it. It's on the website. Maybe they we did? should tell someone to post that. <laughs> I'm seeing it in Twitter. That's where I'm seeing it. Nice. That makes me so much more relaxed. <laughs> no, seriously, dude. If they hadn't had that, I would have been panicking. Yeah, I'm glad they're having it, too. Because when we got an event invite, I didn't really know whether to be happy or cry. Pardon me? I said when we got an event invite and then when we didn't think there was going to be a live stream, I kind of wanted to cry. I did too because the idea of having to both type and shoot uh, made me want to, I don't know, just cry. Just crawl into a little field ball. All right, has anybody seen Peter? Oh, Flarg! Can you see if he is in the Slack? I don't have it on this machine. 
Can I see what? If Peter's in Slack, I don't have no, it on this not. machine. I am loath to start without him, for he is the source of our merriment. Ali, have you seen Guardians of the Galaxy yet? No. Oh my god. Is that a new movie? What? What? <laughs> yeah, it came you're out sometime after me. Harry Potter. You're going to fire me. It came out sometime after Harry Potter. <laughs> after? that's uh, Everything for me works chronologically between Harry Potter. When did it come out in relation to Harry Potter? Oh, my God. You are so not Groot. So, so not Groot. What does that word mean? Well, when you see the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, you'll know. Okay. The hell I just finally on? watched the Avengers. Peter, you jotted your distant time. I was about to fire Allie for not knowing what the Guardians of the Galaxy movie was. Peter's a head without a neck. Well, we have no video yet, but Peter's got a mellifluous voice. <laughs> turn camera off, turn camera on. Do you detect it now? Come on, don't be dumb. <laughs> You've done this every week for the last year. You know how to do this. We've been over this before. Why did you stick the peanut butter sandwich in the VCR? God. i got to quit and be right back. I, All right. I've been having problems every week with my camera. I don't know what's going on. I'll be right back. In Mother Russia, camera has problems with you. Do you do any different accents, Allie? Midwestern. That's your normal accent. Oh, I guess not. I grew up, when, when I first moved to uh, Quebec, because I didn't speak French, they put me in a classe d'accueil, which is where they put everyone who doesn't speak French, and they were like a bunch, mostly people of different descent, so I had to learn tons of, of dialects and accents. Hey, Peter, I see you. There we go, finally. Where did I don't you know live before what Quebec? What's going on? I was born in South Africa. Oh, really? Ich bin Südafrika, yeah, I... Very different kind of English that people speak there. Yas and yas came to Canada, learned to speak with shorter eyes. <laughs> and then I heard people from Boston, and I wasn't sure where I was. <laughs> Could have been worse. Could have been Cape Breton. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, some of the some of the um, maritime accents they actually uh, um, subtitle on Canadian news. I don't blame them. They subtitle them like when when the when the rare Newfoundlander ends up on the news here, they have to. I, <laughs> I went down to get the cod fish in the sweaty poppy. Yeah, it's, it's it's fun. I remember when Big Country went went big in the eighties. Uh, remember that band, Big Country? Yeah. Um, their lead singer Stuart, whatever his name was. Um, they they MTV would have to subtitle him because his brogue was so thick that nobody could understand what he was saying. <laughs> Ouch. I'm having trouble pulling up my lower third. I don't have mine on because when I put mine on, it makes me into a tiny little box. Well, it I only guess does we'll just... it to whoever's hosting it or what? I don't know, Allie. This Google stuff makes no sense to me, but it's free, so I'm getting what I paid for. We'll just ride bareback then. Never mind. All right. Are you guys ready to start? <sighs> yeah. All right. Here we go. It is September 4, 2014. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to go over the last-minute iPhone 6 rumors, iWatch rumors, iPad rumors, and everything and anything pertaining to Apple's September 9th event. This is the iMore Show. Joining me, as always, we have the kaiju of Mac, Mr. Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? Good, Renee. How are you today? I am doing very well, thank you. I'm sorry your, cam your camera was giving you such sorus. Oh, yeah, I don't know what the hell's going on, man. I, I need tech support, I think. <laughs> you call yourself. I know, right? Self? Okay, you can change hats at least. That at least gives you some sort of dynamism. There we go. Also joining us, we have iMore's resident ninja, Ms. Ali Kazmu. How are you, Ali? I'm good. You said you were Ms. Midwestern before. Could you please make up your mind? <laughs> Is that a big gulp? It's a Starbucks. Oh. I have the Canadian version. I have a second cup. I think Peter's just happy I don't have Tim Hortons. Yeah. I've never had Tim Hortons. They have some now, like, not in Ohio, which is, for those not familiar with American geography, the state next to us. It's where Derek Kessler lives. Do you, do you have Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Allie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So if you want to try Tim Hortons coffee, all you have to do is get a Dunkin' Donuts coffee and grind out a lit cigarette in it, and it'll taste about the same. Oh. I remember when I was a kid, and someone told me that drinking Pepsi, uh, how they made Pepsi was they poured a bottle of Coke halfway up each bottle of Pepsi, added water, sugar, and stirred. <laughs> that sounds legit. I believed it when I was a kid. I don't know how long it took me to learn better. Yeah, that sounds plausible, though, unfortunately. <laughs> all right, so we have a big show. Um we're on the verge of the next iPhone event. It is September 9th. That is just a few days away. I'll be jetting over there. I'm leaving Sunday, actually. I'm going to get there early because I want to get a bunch of stuff done. But we are we, we are so close we can taste it. But bef before we get to that, our mutual friend, uh, Jim Dalrymple, who's been in um, the Bay Area for a while, happened to be out on his, what I'm only guessing is his daily promenade. And he noticed that Apple was building a massive structure next to the Flint Center. Peter, I, some people say it's a garage. Some people say it's a home kit test studio. Some people say that it's a health kit hospital. Some people say that they're doing it just to mess with our minds. What is this giant thing, and why are they building it? My theory is that it's the world's biggest iPod hi-fi. Oh, hey -oh. Uh Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's a really good question. You know, the Flint Center um, is, is of historic significance to Apple. It's where Apple introduced the original Macintosh 30 years ago. Um, it, it, but Apple has also invited a lot of people uh, to, to, um, to, to, to this event next week. It, it wouldn't surprise me if it's something as... Um, you know, as as banal as just additional seating for it's, everyone. It's the overflow area. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, it could be. I don't know. I don't know what the capacity of the Flint Center is, but Two, uh, just over two thousand. All right. So you know, I mean, if, assuming that that Apple fills that to capacity, this could be where they're planning on showing off new products. I don't know. I don't have the the foggiest idea. But you know what? I also haven't read a single reputable thing that's got any idea whatsoever. Everybody is just kind of blue skying on what this mysterious structure next to the Flint Center might be. But I mean, it is, it's sort of like Close Encounters of the Third Kind when Richard Dreyfuss is building that, that mountain in that you're, you're watching Apple build this. For a second, you think, is Apple really building this? Are they building something? Because most people don't do stuff like this. This is not normal consumer electronics company behavior. This is true. Apple does, I mean, Apple, it, it, uh, Apple, Apple's experience here at the Flint Center notwithstanding, neither Apple nor other companies typically build an entirely new structure um, in order to uh, present a new product. So it's pretty remarkable. I, and I think it signifies just how important Apple uh, feels like this product rollout is. So, Ali, my favorite part is that we got good pictures of it because some dude threw a, uh, flew a drone over it. I mean, I enjoyed when they flew a drone through the fireworks on New Year's Eve or, or uh, Fourth of July. I enjoyed it when they flew a drone over the Cupertino go-kart track that's eventually going to become Apple's you know, headquarters, too. These drones are amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my friend got a GoPro last week, and we had one of those drones we... Um, we bought one for uh, Heather's nephew, my girlfriend's nephew, and he got like six of them. So we decided we were going to keep one. And I can't figure out how to work the GoPro. So <laughs> um, once we do, I want to have some fun with those. But, yeah, it's kind of amazing how now, like, you can't really keep anything secret because someone will just fly a drone and they'll find it anyway. How come they don't have X-ray drones? Why isn't there a drone flying there that's X-raying this and seeing that this is the world's biggest iPod Hi-Fi? It's an iHouse. All right, a couple other things. We got a question. Um, where did it go? Getting too many questions coming in. This is from Curtis. Uh, how much, if at all, do you think Apple will address the so-called iCloud security scandal um, at the keynote? I, I spoke about this on Mac. I'm going to give you guys my theory, and then I want to hear your theory. So my theory is if they do address it, they are going to try to address it in a way that helps them sell more iPhones, because that's their job. So they'll come out and they'll say, Security is an industry-wide problem. And I'll put up a list of companies that have had security uh, problems recently, you know, maybe including the Targets and the Home Depots, but any sort of any sort of hacking activity, Heartbleed and OpenSSL, whatever it has to be, they'll put that up, and then they'll say, we think we can do better. At Apple, we want to do better. We know your data is private and important to you, and so we're doing ephemeral messaging in iOS 8. We're making sure, as you know, your fingerprints are locked down in Touch ID. When they're announcing the mobile payments, like, we know you're nervous about your wallet, but just like Touch ID, this will never, ever leave your phone. It will never be in any cloud, including iCloud. So I, th I think if they choose to address it, it will be as a way to sell more stuff. Can they get away with that, Peter? 
Of course they can. And, you know, if anybody says, well, that's not addressing the issue, I, I, I think that they're being either naive or willfully stupid about the way the companies work. You know, Apple's not going to make a big deal about it, I don't think. If Apple addresses it all, at all, it's going to be couched in the... Um, uh, the the user experience of how secure data is um, or can be using other Apple technology. I don't think that that Apple is is really going to use this opportunity where the world's spotlight is shining on them um, to do a mea culpa and talk about uh, how badly they they screwed up. Because according to Apple's own uh, public statement about um, this celebrity nude pic scandal their system wasn't at fault to begin with. This was, uh, uh, you know, it, it, this was circumventing people's passwords. This wasn't something that was a failure of the systems that were in place. Yeah, the only possible exception to that is the Find My iPhone lack of rate limiting on on password checks, because that lets brute force, but to Peter's Which point... Which is the problem that they've corrected yes. at this point. And, but to Peter's point, we don't know what, if any, amount of stuff was taken with that. So I mean, there's a variety of factors here. Ali, do you have a take on this? Yeah. If you're a celebrity and you know that you're going to... I mean, you should know any time that you're a high-profile anything that people are going to try to break into your crap. I mean, I get password resets for Instagram and stuff on a regular basis, but I also don't use password one as my password. And if you're doing that, shame on you. But, I'm, yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, the rate refresh, like, they fixed that. It doesn't matter who has your accounts. If you create an easy password and someone finds your email, they're going to get into it. That's just how it is. And I don't understand either if it was, if they did indeed have iCloud accounts, when you sign into a new device or someone signs in from another location, don't you get an email? So I don't want to get too, we spend a lot of time talking about this on Vectors, and I want to talk about the event mostly, but just quickly for people who haven't heard about it, what what happens with this is they they do a bunch of things. This is the best uh, theory so far. Is first, someone approaches them typically and says, I want to break into this celebrity, or this, and it doesn't even have to be a celebrity, this person's account, and they try to get as much information as they can about them. They go on social networks. They even try to approach people in real life, talk to friends of them in real life. They try to find out everything they can to, so that they can either guess the security questions or guess the password. They'll try to brute force it. If they find a bug like this rate limit in, in Find My iPhone, they'll absolutely exploit that, and they have a known target. So even if it takes a long time to brute force it, they're only specifically doing you know one or two people. Uh, once they do that, they then they don't actually load it onto a phone. They go and they use uh, tools created in Russia that are meant to be sold to police departments to rip the iCloud backups off the servers. And iCloud backups are typically stored, I believe, on Amazon, AWS, or Microsoft's um, Azure uh, services. And then they use the same tool to start digging through those backups. And they'll go back over and over again, and they'll find old backups, new ones. They'll wait weeks, get another new backup, and they'll keep going until they find something that they want. So it's a really thorny, tricky problem to solve, and it's a problem. It really, it sounds like a cop out, and people think I'm defending Apple when I say this. And so for the last time, I'll explain it. I am not defending Apple. The best solution for me as a consumer is that Apple had a hack, and somebody went in and took the stuff because then Apple could fix it, and I would never have to worry about it again. But it's not that. It is a widespread, many-vector, prolonged, you know, involved attack, and that means that everybody. Just like you have to be careful where you go and you know who you talk to, we tell kids this every day. You got to be careful with your online data. You've got to secure it. And in a perfect world, we could just blame Apple and then pretend everything was safe. We don't live in that world. We don't live in a world where I'm a clown made of candy either. So uh, strong passwords, password managers, and Ali has put up a ton of stuff like which are the best password managers, how to secure your iPhone, how to do two-factor authentication, all that kind of stuff. So just go to imore.com/security. You'll find all of it there. Whew, breathe. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think that Apple will make a big deal about it on the show, and if they do talk about it, it's going to be in the context of how they're improving it and making it better for their customers. There was a late-breaking rumor um, earlier today that we might see the new iPads at this event as well, which we haven't heard before. Traditionally, Apple, at least the last couple of years, Apple has done iPhone and iPod in September and then iPad and Mac in October. On one hand, the iPad refresh this year is probably not going to be huge. It's going to be Touch ID, maybe a gold um, uh, color, color scheme. 
but nothing as revolutionary, nothing as major as the iPad Air and iPad Mini Retina last year. Peter, could you see Apple just kind of sort of folding the iPad in to uh, Tuesday's event? Possibly, if you know this year's iPad update is just kind of a minor, you know, sideline thing. Um, you know, if Apple had something bigger up its sleeve for next year, maybe. Otherwise, I, I think that Apple would be losing um, an opportunity to. Uh, you know, break out the iPad as it has in years past. Yeah, I mean, like, there's two things to break apart there. One is if the iPad does get put in here, that leaves uh, October wide open for the Mac, which means to me, if you have to fill a whole event and it's just the Mac, you're going to have to have a lot of Mac stuff to fill that in. You know, if you have the iPad, you can go 50-50, but if, if you don't have the iPad, that's 100% a Mac event. And maybe I could see that. I mean, maybe Retina MacBook Pro, maybe 4K Macs. Maybe that's when they address the iTunes stuff and the iTunes versions of sort of the media versions of continuity so you can continue watching and listening to stuff as you move around. So there is a lot of material there, but I don't know if that's a one-and-a-half-hour keynote yet. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think that it really is. I, I don't know. I But, you know, I, I guess we've got, what, less than five days now before we'll know for sure. Yeah, Ali, are you are you do you see where a world where they would throw the iPads out this quickly? I think I think of it more from a financial standpoint too. Those are their two biggest product launches typically every year. People get the most psyched over iPhones and iPads. Throwing them into one category in one launch, that kind of seems to me like you're splitting what people might buy. I mean, a lot of people don't have the means to go out and buy a brand new iPad and a brand new iPhone at the same time. So you're also talking two different fiscal quarters, I think. I don't remember what Apple's quarters run, but it just seems to me like that would be iPads are geared towards holidays, iPhones are around this time. I can't really see them doing that. Yeah, and if you want to introduce even more, like I'm sure there'll be more iOS 8 features just for the iPhone 6 introduced uh, this next week, but there could be even more features. I mean, traditionally Apple would do a point one release in the fall, back when they still had iPhones in the summer, and they would have new stuff on the new iPod Touches. But I could see, for example, if um, split if, if multi-window doesn't make it into iOS 8 but is ready for a iOS 8.1, that could be something you show off at an iPad event in October. The continuity stuff doesn't ship until... Uh, Yosemite in October, you can show people that again, you know, get them excited for that again. It just seems like a lot of material. They wouldn't be maximizing their, exactly your, to your guys' points, they wouldn't be maximizing the iPad by doing that. You could also argue, too, I mean, the iPad Air just came out in, what, November of last year? Uh, announced in October. It shipped in October. iPad Mini came out later. Okay, I thought I bought it. I thought it was the beginning of November. Either way, I mean, they haven't even been out for a year. So iPods or iPads, I don't feel run the same product cycle as iPhones either. And announcing one eight, seven months after one was just launched, that doesn't make sense to me. So Curtis is asking if they make an October Mac event, could they throw the Apple TV in with that as well? The last I heard, the Apple TV update is scheduled for the spring, along with the iPad Pro, and there was something else I forget. Something maybe even the iWatch will get reannounced there because the Going back to 2007, the Apple TV originally was announced as the iTV in the fall of 2006 and then reintroduced as the Apple TV during the iPhone event in January of 2007. You know, and then the iPhone, that, that iPhone was introduced in January, shipped in June. The iPad was announced in January, shipped in April. Apple is not adverse. Peter pointed out last week, the Mac Pro, shown off at of WWDC, shipped at the end of the year. Apple is not adverse to pre-announcing new products, you know, especially if they don't want them to leak by someone else first. We'll see. It's going to be interesting. They're going to have a lot in this event. Um, I don't know how much more this event. I don't know how much more I will be able to process just being at this event. Although, uh, Renee, I'm sure you're breathing a sigh, a sigh of relief knowing that Apple is going to live stream it. Yeah, so we were talking about this yesterday because you never, typically you don't know, sometimes not even until the day of, sometimes not even until just before the event whether Apple's going to live stream it. Uh, I'm going to the event, but I'm going alone. So if there was no live stream, I would have to try to photograph and live blog the event at once. I've done that for WWDC. It is not easy. Uh, so, you know, with having Peter and Ali here who can watch the live stream and work with me on the live blog, it is just so much easier. And I think it's better for, this is a huge event. Apple wants everybody to see this. It just makes so much sense. It's better for everybody that they live stream it. Absolutely. I know some blogs get upset because they figure, oh, we're traveling all the way out there, and now it's not exclusive. To, uh, you know, it's not your world. I don't know. No, and I think that that's ridiculous. Our job a little easier. I think that that's ridiculous, exactly. You know, to, to Ali's point, I think that... Um, 
that uh, it makes our jobs easier when people can follow along instead of using us as the exclusive filter for the information that they're getting. Well, for most people on the East Coast and in basically everywhere in America, it's it's in the middle of the work day. I mean, not a lot of people are going to be able to stream it anyway, so they're going to be browsing your website and browsing for text recaps of, you know, what's going on, and I think the live stream helps us better understand what's going on so we can relay that information. That's certainly a very good point, too. All right, so we're getting a lot of questions. A lot of them are the same, and it's hard to answer these. So, for example, a lot of people have been asking us whether the 5.5-inch iPhone will be announced alongside the 4. Point, alongside the 4.7-inch. My suspicion, and only my uninformed suspicion, is that it probably won't be, only because we haven't seen as many part leaks for it, which in my mind means that it is not as far along production as... 4.7 inch because typically when you make tens of millions of something those parts start to leak out it's just it's, it's an uncorkable genie uh, and we haven't seen that for the 5.5 we've only seen a few parts so my guess is that might come later and the only thing that I think is is non-ideal about that is a lot of people um, are going to want to decide which one they want and if one's available earlier Sure, some people might say, I'll get the 4.7 inch now because I've been waiting and it's good enough, and then next year I'll get the 5.5. But I think a lot of people would prefer to be able to look at both of them at the same time and say, no, no, this is the one that I want. I think it could go either way. I Part of me thinks that maybe they'll announce it and it just won't be launched, and part of me thinks they won't. And at the, you know, I don't think Apple wants to purposely piss people off by announcing one thing and then a month later saying, oh, and here's another iPhone. But at the same token, if they announce it, they're going to give up a good amount of consumers that probably would have lined up for the 4.7 inch, but now they're going to wait. So I guess it depends on how Apple wants to approach that. It's how much they'll care about Wall Street, because in, in a pure Apple world, they wouldn't care. They would say, we're introducing a 4.7 and a 5.5 inch iPhone. The 4.7 one will be available on the 19th. The 5.5 one will be available in October or November, whenever it's available. And, they, and if people decided to defer buying, that would be fine. But the only problem with that is in the world in which we live, and again, I keep referring to this world in the third person. It's kind of weird. They... Last year, they had both the iPhone 5S and the iPhone 5C debut at the same time, and they sold, I think, 9 million something units that first weekend. And people, regardless of it, whether it's apples or oranges or not, are going to compare opening weekend sales numbers this year. And if one of the two new devices isn't available the same weekend, those numbers will be lower. And Peter, having read uh, mainstream media lately, I know that that context will be absolutely absent from the coverage. Yeah, absolutely. No question. So yeah, so the the simple answer is we don't know. And the same thing with 128 gigabytes. Again, it's a rumor. Everybody wants it. Um, most people want it. People like having local stuff. We'll see if we get it. We were, should have gotten it last year if Apple had followed the same pattern. They didn't. So next this year is the next likely target. Can you talk about the specs of the iPhone 6, or can you guess at the specs? I can. I mean, there's certain things that logic dictates. For example, it's probably not going to be worse in, in almost any major way from last year's iPhone. Like, it'll probably still have a great screen. It'll still have LTE. Uh, things like 802.11 AC Wi-Fi make sense to me because Apple's routers support it. Their Macs support it. Um, a bigger screen probably means more pixels, so that makes sense to me. The camera probably won't get worse. How much they can make it better, I don't know, because I don't know enough about camera optics, but these are thin devices. I would like there to be optical image stabilization, but I won't bank on it because Apple hasn't, you know, they've traditionally focused on the chipset, not the not the optics. Uh, but I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Ali, but I think it's a mistake to focus on the specs now. Like I think a bigger iPhone is nice. I think a better camera is nice. But Apple sells these as experience that is impossible to remove from the software and services they provide on top of them. I think that people confuse specs with improvement and better because maybe the camera doesn't get optical image stabilization, but the software and the hardware inside the phone can better support that. And I've said it before, in the iPhone 5S, the difference between a 5 and a 5S software-wise when it comes to capturing panoramics or some other types, it it's night and day. I mean, you can see that Apple really focuses on software. I don't care what the specs say. If my phone produces better pictures than the last generation, I think Apple's done their job. So I think people's focus too much on spec sheets and not the experience that you're given. 
I think that makes sense. And it leads me to wonder, Peter, complete tangent, but you know, I don't hear people asking us about specs for the Mac that much anymore. Like we people sort of know what Intel's got coming on the roadmap, but no one no one really says is it gonna have a 4K eyesight camera? <laughs> you know, is it gonna have a high like they're, they're happy with the broad strokes, like it's gonna have a retina display. It's not really the specific pixels. Do you think that that's just because mobile is still less mature and you know maybe we'll mature into a situation where just the spec exhaustion has taken place and we don't we can't worry about it so much anymore? Oh uh, yeah, I think you answered your own question. You know, the way that Apple and other companies, not just Apple, are differentiating their their um uh, their products in the PC space now um, is with features. It's not with uh, with specs. The spec wars in the PC market are pretty much over. Um, so there, there's some stuff to get excited about spec-wise, like you said, you know, whether or not the next MacBook Air will have a Retina display or not. But um, that, that's really a feature more than a spec. And I think that you know, the mobile is still a very fast-moving target. There's a lot of heat and light right now in the development of uh, new processing technology in mobile, whether it's Apple with its ARM processors or NVIDIA with its Tegra uh, products, um, even somewhat in you know in the Android space as well. Uh, you know we're seeing movement uh, with uh, interesting stuff there. So people are still really Im invested in, and I shouldn't say people just generally. I think that if you ask the average consumer, they don't give a damn. <laughs> what kind of processor is inside their device. They want to know how long the battery is going to last. Um, they want to know how big the screen is. They want to know how much memory it has so, or how much storage capacity it has so they know how many apps or how many pictures they can put on it. Um, but uh, you, certainly in the tech circles in which we run, there I think is, is a markedly greater bit of, of interest in understanding specs. Um, than, than there really is um, in the Mac space or the PC space, just generally. Yeah, uh, Apple in 2011 said, you know, uh, the technology is fantastic, but what can you do with it? And I think that's going to be the story we see. I'm going to take a quick break and tell you a little bit about lynda.com, sponsoring us today. lynda.com is an easy and affordable way to help you learn, instantly stream thousands of courses created by experts on software, web development, photography, graphic design, and more. What's great about lynda.com is it always has something new. I don't think any one person could finish what they already have, don't get me wrong, but if there's something that, that's there and you don't see it yet, just wait because they're putting up new stuff all the time and they're also covering new things, new technologies, new programs as they become available almost always on the same day as launch and if not the same day then very soon thereafter. It's easy to learn, there's high quality, easy to follow tutorials, great tools, they have beginners courses, advanced courses, really something for everyone at every level and they also have mobile apps so if you're not at your computer you can watch it on your iPhone, your iPad, your Android phone. And here's the best part. It's one low monthly price, $25. It gives you unlimited access to over 100,000 videos and tutorials. Here's just a quick taste of them. Some of, them will pop, some of the more popular ones right now. iOS 7, iPhone, and iPad Essentials. And I'm betting that's going to be iOS 8 just as soon as Apple gets it out to everybody. iPad Tips and Tricks. Create an iPad web app. Shooting with the iPhone 5S. Setting up your mobile office to work from anywhere. So if you want to use the iPad to get more productive, if you want to take the iPhone as the camera for your next vacation, if you want to actually start getting into developing iPhone or iPad apps, you can do all of that starting with lynda.com. Uh, they have literally more features than I have time to tell you about. It's incredibly scalable. They, you can watch little bits of it. You can watch large bits of it. You can go through the, the timeline and go through the transcripts. There's any way possible that you can learn. They have made it easy for you to learn. 30% of colleges and universities and most Ivy League schools offer lynda.com subscriptions to their students and faculty members. That is just a fun fact for you to think about. So here's the deal. We've worked out a special offer with lynda.com to provide you with access to all courses free for seven days. That's absolutely free for seven days, all courses. All you have to do is visit lynda.com slash imore and try Lynda for free. Again, seven days. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash iMore. Go there, learn, your brain will thank you. All right, so here's how I imagine it going down. We'll have Tim Cook, we'll have music playing, the, the lights will go down, Tim Cook will walk out, he will tell us what Apple believes. He'll give us just a quick overview of Apple. If he does any Apple Store stuff, I'm kind of hoping he hands over to Angela Ahrens now because she's been there for a while. She's a really good public speaker, and I'd like to see, if this is the time they've chosen to talk about Apple retail, I'd like to see Apple retail 
up there. I don't know if they have a really compelling story for this event. I don't know if anything major is happening. Um, but if they want to show off a new store being built, or Ali, if they want to show off how they're you know, doing recycling programs or trade-in programs or something, I think Aaron's would be a great person to talk about it. Well, maybe that's what that's the secret behind uh, the the mysterious structure outside the Flint Center. Pop up Apple Store. Yeah, it's a pop up Apple Store, and it's just going to float magically away, sort of like uh, um, a cloud, the Best Bend Cloud City or something. Have you have you seen anything with the trade in programs and the re and on site repair, Ali? You think that's that's getting interesting yet? <sighs> They're pretty limited on what they do in store, and I can see why. I mean, Apple stores have such a high volume, it doesn't really make sense. They're, Apple's end concern typically in store is customer experience, and if someone's waiting around for hours to for an appointment or for their phone to get fixed, that's a bad experience in their eyes. So little things like batteries, screens, um, the way they do those, they do them in a way that's super fast, but it, it does limit them. So. I think the reuse and recycling program comes into play there because the phones that obviously they take in are then refurbished and sold as refurbished or used as replacements. So I think that I don't really see Apple expanding too much past that hmm. just Makes because sense. I think it wouldn't interfere with customer experience. Okay, fair enough. I will still hope for an Angela Aaron sighting though. It's going to be on my wish list. Yeah, I would like to see her too. I, I kind of want to see a female on stage at an Apple event. I don't think we've seen that. Well, they're making. We've seen uh, a couple of years. We've seen third-party developers do demos mm -hmm. on the stage, but no one from Apple. And the, given their big diversity push now, it really would be great to see that because that's how you 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 turn a vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle by by intentional action, um, and then it you know sort of takes off on its own. Um, I think Phil Schiller will probably handle the iPhone duties like he's done every year. He'll come out. He's already done the two new devices shtick, but uh, the iPad bigger, sorry, the iPhone bigger. Um, this could be an interesting sell, Peter, because previously with the iPhone 5, when they made it taller, they emphasized how your thumb could still reach every part of it. They even had an ad for that. I don't see them doing a mea culpa. I see them maybe saying, we've gotten to the point where software can handle a lot of the navigation. Now we don't have to limit the size of the hardware anymore. That would be a sensible way to go. The other way to go would be to, um, uh, to, to uh, I, I don't know, offer thumb prosthetics? <laughs> iThumb. That's what it is. It's a giant pop-up Apple store to sell iThumbs right on the premises. I feel right. like they've kind of been training us for a larger screen since iOS 7. Um, they really push gestures. And I think that gestures are a way to maneuver around. I ne almost never reach in the top. I hold my phone with my right hand, and I can't really think offhand of many times when I even have to reach in the top left corner of my phone anymore because I can use gestures and swipe from the, sc the sides of the screen. So I kind of feel like Apple handles a lot of those hardware issues with software solutions. I had to do it the other day to cancel out of something, and it was it was so rare I actually noticed, wow, I have to reach all the way up to the top left corner of my phone. I now get irritated when developers don't use swipe gestures because yeah. I'm so used to using them. If it comes down to choosing between two apps and one of them supports gestures the way it should, I most likely probably will choose that app. Uh, here's a question from Mac Interactive, and we've answered this before, but I think we have more information now. Uh, Yosemite has to be available the same day as iOS 8, because otherwise it's not going to be compatible with continuity and iCloud Drive. The latest I've heard is that it's not coming till October, and I think that matches with what a lot of other people have heard. And I think, as you pointed out, Peter, last year Apple was happy to ship Mavericks without iCloud Keychain, and they'll probably be happy to ship Yosemite without, sorry, uh, iOS 8 without continuity until Yosemite hits. Yeah, I think people are overthinking this. You know, these are certainly core operating system features, and it's something that, that Apple has, um, you know, made a big deal about, but that doesn't mean that they have to be offered um, uh, day and date uh, at the same time as uh, the new operating system or the new product. Let us not forget that the vast majority of people who are using iOS devices don't have a Macintosh. Mac ownership is still a relatively minor percentage of, uh, of, of overall Apple ownership. So many, many people are going to be able to use iOS 8 just fine um, without experiencing any kind of issues related to, um, you know, lack of continuity features in Yosemite. 
uh, iCloud Drive is a different story. Um, you know, I don't necessarily see iCloud Drive um, as not Apple not being able to flip the switch on iCloud Drive the day that iOS 8 ships. Um, even if Yosemite folks have to wait wait for it for a while. Now, is there going to be some grumbling uh, from the Mac community or from people who use both platforms uh, if Apple doesn't ship Yosemite the same day that it ships iOS 8? I suspect there probably will be. And you know, some of those complaints are going to be valid, but it's not a showstopper for the vast majority of Apple's user base. Yeah. It seems that. to me like you know Dropbox and Google Drive and a lot of other cloud storage services have hook-ins, and it would be really baffling to me if Apple couldn't issue an update to OS X just to make iCloud Drive compatible until Yosemite releases. I feel like that's a reasonable solution. And features like continuity and some of the other stuff in iOS 8, like Peter said, not a lot of them own Macs, and not only that, it doesn't break functionality. The functionality is still there, and as soon as Yosemite becomes available, it'll be active. Yeah, I can see that. Here's a question from Skippy. Having no experience with giant Android phones, what is it about bigger screens that makes it better? My iPhone only feels small when I'm surfing the web. So that's an interesting question, Ali. What, you have a Galaxy S5, uh, I think, and an HTC One. Is there anything to like about the bigger screen? Like, why, why, do we, why is Apple making a bigger screen? I don't know. I, like, when I compare this to my phone here, I mean, there's a big size difference here. I personally don't really like the way a larger phone feels in my hand, only because and this this is an issue that I see, like, some of these things, and I think they showed prototypes where Apple was actually going to move the power button to the side. Due to I the think they will for the iPhone 6, yeah. The problem I have with stuff like that is I consistently hit that button with my hand, like when I'm holding the phone, and... I hope that's not going to be the case. I don't necessarily think bigger is better. It is for some people, and for other people it's not, but I think it's important for Apple to hit that segment at this point because people have already said they want a bigger iPhone. Um, I don't know. I think it's a matter of preference. Do you have a take on it, Peter? No. No? I'm going to no, give mine. I'm going to defer to, to you and Allie here. So my, there, I think Gruber and uh, John Gruber and Craig Hockenberry discuss, had discussed it at length on the talk show, so you can check that out for more. But uh, it comes down to basically some people need bigger and some people need more. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're not getting any younger. And for some people, the iPhone, the everything from the lettering to the buttons to everything is just too small for them to be comfortable. And yes, things like dynamic text help with that, but it is constrained by the size of the display. There's also people who want more pixels. They want to be able, when Steve Jobs said that one of the reasons they made the iPad was because the larger screen allowed for a higher class of software. I did a big write-up on what's, ca what's coming with adaptive UI in iOS 8, and it's one of the things that Apple released for developers. But part of that is, for example, you can now, uh, with iOS 8, have an iPhone app when you're in portrait, and then when you rotate, you can go to the split view that you usually get on an iPad. So like right now, an iPhone is one column, a horizontal, one column orientation in, sorry, one column in portrait, one column in landscape. With iOS 8, it can be one column in portrait, two columns in landscape. So you imagine the mail app on the iPhone, rotate landscape, you have the iPad's version of the mail app. And that's interesting on a 4-inch iPhone. That's really interesting on a 4.7 or 5.5-inch iPhone, especially if a lot of apps start doing that. You essentially have a mini iPad, and then you have a higher class, a higher level of software. You can not only have bigger stuff and more stuff, you can have better stuff. Uh, eventually, Apple will be constrained by the size of the screen as to what kind of software they can make. So it's something they need to do at a certain point. They sort of let people grow up with it, and they've sort of grown up with it, but I think this is just the next step. Um, and they've gotten technology to the point where, like Ali said, you have the gestures and the holds and all these different ways of controlling it, so you don't need to touch the entire part of the screen. And you can also design a device that can be big and can be thin and have lots of really cool technology inside it. So I think that is at the core why the bigger phone will be better for some people. Certainly not everybody, but for people uh, who want an iPhone to be more of a computer, to be more of a primary computing device, it's going to be a benefit to them. Yeah, and certainly we've seen a, a, a certain amount of drop-off in iPad sales, you know, or just tablet sales in general. People aren't refreshing them as frequently as um, analysts might have expected a year or two ago. Um, but people are continuing to use the devices that are in their pockets or that are on them. 
Um, and uh, having a larger screen helps bring that iPad style experience that Renee's talking about to more people uh, in a device that they're going to depend on every day and hopefully uh, that they're going to replace in a year or two years um, as opposed to just waiting for it to wear out. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I can't wait to see Peter with his 5.5 inch iPhone like a boombox on his shoulder. Yes, indeed. I'm looking forward to it myself. Although I don't know if I'm actually going to go with a big iPhone. I've I've got to say I'm I'm I I, I from if if the spy photos that I've seen are any indication, I think that the um the 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 what is it the 4.7 inch is going yeah. to be just fine for me. Sweet spot. We got a couple of questions about the protruding camera. I explained a lot of that I think last week. We talked about that and why you need Z index on a camera and you may not want it on a phone. So just check back on last week's show. We went over it at length. Um, I'm not sure if they'll do iPhones first. I think that they will because the iPhone is not the new thing, so that makes sense for pe for them to give us that first, and I think it'll be really exciting on its own. Going into iWatch for a minute, uh, we originally, I heard, a bunch of the people heard that it was going to be October. Uh, now it sounds like it's going to be this event, although it's not going to ship with this event. It might ship later in the year, might ship next year. But the idea of Apple's wearable is still... It hasn't leaked, again, probably because they haven't begun manufacturing it yet. Uh, it hasn't gone for FDA or FCC approval yet. But the idea about it, I think people are starting to wrap their head around it. The, the concern I have um, is that expectations are too high for this now. And a lot of that is I, the markets and a lot of that is a media. Like Apple has been told that they are doomed unless they have new product categories, which I still think is ridiculous because what's a new product category? The Apple II was, the Mac was, an, was a development on a personal computer. The iPod was, the iPhone was, but the iPad and the iPod Touch are variants on the iPhone. Those aren't new product categories. And iWatch is probably going to be a variant of the iPod and the iPhone. It's going to be a multi-touch wearable device. Um, that does a few things very well. And to me, you know, if you want to call that a new product category because it fits your message, great. Um, but none, there's nothing in there that's going to sell hundreds of millions of units. It's like an Apple TV. It's something that makes having your iPhone better. So I just worry, Peter, that the media and the markets are going to build us up so high that nothing Apple shows could possibly be any good. Well, that's the fear that I think we have um, almost every time Apple has a product announcement. That you know, there's there's going to be um, something that's going to come along that, uh, um, or, or there's going to be some expectation that's going to be unmet, and uh, you know, Apple stock price is going to plummet, or Apple's uh, public opinion about Apple is going to plummet. I I don't think that we can live in fear of what. Uh, uh, might or might not happen. I mean, and you know, as far as having a truly disruptive technology, you know, I, I'd argue the opposite, Renee. I'd argue that the iPad, although it was certainly based on you know OS X and it was based on the groundwork that Apple laid with the iPhone and the iPod Touch, it was a different product category because, you know, tablets I existed long before the iPad did. Uh, but the iPad is is the product that kind of made the tablet category what it is mm -hmm. today. So it was definitely a genre-defining product at the very The moment. Mac as well. Yeah, the Mac as well. You know, P PCs existed long before the Mac, and Apple, of, of course, was very well um, uh, situated with uh, um, the Apple II. But, uh, you know, the Mac once again came, came along and redefined it. So is this going to happen again with the iWatch or whatever else Apple has up its sleeve? Maybe, but that's not the important thing because those products aren't going to be um, uh, aren't, aren't going to make a material impact on Apple's business on yeah. day one. You know, that's something that, that we're only going to know a year or two down the road um, after Apple sells them and keeps selling them and keeps selling them and refines them and then keeps selling them. Uh, that we're no, We know we're going to have another genre-defining product on our hands. So it's something that we just can't know on the first day. Yeah, that reminds me, Al. You remember when the iPod came out, they said it was lame. You know, should get a, no, uh, a nomad. And then when the iPhone came out, you know, ah, it's lame. It doesn't even have apps. Can't do MMS. And then the iPad came out, lame. It's just a big, it's just a big iPhone. So I'm sure when this comes out, there'll be someone going, ah, lame. It's just a small. It's just an iPad that, sorry, an iPod that runs iOS. Yeah, I would agree, and I'm sure we're gonna see blog posts that sound like that. Um, I think with wearables. I think it's all going to go back to software and support. It's just like NFC. I mean, like, you know, Renee's, like, drenched in it in Canada. It's not really caught on here. I think it's just going to depend on how many merchants. Someone brought up a good point. I don't even remember who it was about 
Apple already has over 800 million credit cards and things on file with iTunes. So it makes it very feasible that a payment system could be something that would get people on board because you already have your information linked. So it becomes very easy for Apple to integrate that and for you to have a watch or your phone or whatever and pay for things. So maybe that'll be a little bit better of a push with merchants, but I really think some of it's going to come back to commercial use and business use and how people integrate home kit or some of those health kit into their products. It's interesting. My understanding, and this is, you know, second, third, fourth hand, is that you pr you probably don't even need iTunes for this. Like it's going to hook into, and we saw like rumors already about Visa, Mastercard, Amex, and an existing NFC technology. So it'll be literally a tap to pay system. And maybe iTunes account will be one of those options, but it'll have really wide range, wide ranging mainstream appeal. I believe Apple is partnering with retailers, so it won't just work everywhere. It'll be sort of like you know when iBooks was introduced and it had half the major publishers, and you were wondering you know whose name wasn't on that slide and why did it fall off. And I'm sure part of that will just be it's hard to make partners and part will, part will be it's hard to get partners ramped up immediately. So we'll have a couple of well-known names up there um, that you'll see they're working with Apple. You can go tap to pay with your iPhone or your iWatch immediately. And then over the coming weeks, we'll see more and more people come on board with it. There has been a lot of media saying that because of the iCloud um, photograph scandal that people aren't going to be trusting of this. I think that because people are reading articles about that, they might have a harder time trusting it. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. But again, my understanding based on indirect information is that all the stuff will be done like Touch ID. It won't be done like iCloud at all. It'll be stored on your device. Your, your credentials are locked into your the secure enclave on the AA chipset, including credit card information. So when you tap to pay, it's a hardware channel. Release that information. It never get, leaves your device, never goes to the apps, never goes to the cloud. So there's nothing that be, can be compromised in that way. But Ali, do you think that's a message that's going to resonate? Or do you think people are just going to see the articles going, oh my god, would you trust Apple with this? Um... I think like all hype, it dies down. You know, I, I can't see that affecting people threw a fit over touch ID last year. So, you know, oh, it's, you know, you're giving your fingerprints to the government. I don't know how many, you know, people or, you know, groups I saw saying that last year. And now you don't really hear too much about touch ID being insecure, or, you know, giving your fingerprints to the cloud because that hype dies down. So it didn't I, die. We killed it. Yeah, well, and I think initially, you know, it's going to be the same thing. People are going to complain about iCloud hacks and people getting your payment information, but how is that any different from someone being able to sign in and I guess they can't really see all of your credit card number, but if someone gets into your iTunes account, they're going to be able to make purchases now. You have a credit card link to that. Well, again, it's I don't think it's a, I don't think the story is about iTunes. I think it's about credit cards and we just saw Home Depot just had a huge a huge yeah. hack. Um, what was the other one? Target it had a huge hack, and I think that is enough to scare retailers to get to want to make it Apple's problem and not their problem anymore. You know, I have a lot of friends, and well, not necessarily friends, but family members that still don't want to put their credit card number online. They won't purchase things from Amazon. They won't set up a PayPal. They won't do things because they don't want to put their credit card number online. And then they're always kind of dumbfounded when I say, you do realize that when Target or whoever swipes your card, it goes on the Internet. Like, I mean, it's the same internet, you know, whether it's encrypted or whatever, you're still putting your number on the internet every time you swipe a debit card. So I think it kind of goes into that round and round argument of what's safe and what's not and how is one thing safer than another. Any system that's created by a person can be hacked by a person. I just got this mental flash of Peter in the in the VW van rocking down the streets of the Cape, just tapping his iPhone, getting his coffee, keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just hold out my hand, grab it, and keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it, we're we're going to see a bunch of dumb headlines when it launches. We'll see a bunch of dumb headlines when Apple announces it, and when it launches, and six months later, it's it's only going to come down to how good and easy an experience it is to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I'm I'm inclined to agree. All right. So, um, what else are we expecting to see here? iOS eight. Any. We'll see again the final stuff there. If there's anything that is dependent on the new hardware, including if there's a new app that either adds to or replaces Passbook, um, 
Oh, getting back to the watch thing, yeah, I, I said this last week, but it's worth repeating. My gut feeling is they're going to take the same tack they took with the original iPhone, the original iPad, and that is they're going to do a few things really well. You know, they're not going to do everything, but they'll do a few things really well, and that seems like it's going to be the health and fitness stuff, the logging of your of your information, that it's going to be the uh, remote control stuff, the home kit stuff, that it's going to be the mobile payment stuff, the pass kit stuff, or whatever else they end up calling it. I haven't heard anything about notifications. I still want them, though, just because it might be in some situations convenient to have those show up on my watch instead of on my uh, phone that's in my pocket or you know otherwise occupied. And I, if there are apps, I don't know if they would be App Store apps the way we know them today or if they'll be remote views the way they are with extensibility widgets. I don't know if I need apps in the first version. Peter, do you need apps in the first version of a wearable? You know, there weren't apps in the first version of the iPhone. Still no apps in the iP- on the Apple TV. I'm not even convinced I need a wearable, Renee. So it's <laughs> it's it, this whole wearables thing has got a long road to hoe with me. A chainable. It's going to be on a chain that you can wear, Peter. Like like Flavor Flav. That would be fine. That would be fine if I could just you know wear a big gold gold chain around my neck with an Apple pendant at the bottom, like a, uh, a Mercedes Benz or VW logo. I would be fine with that. Where's Flavor Moto Motorola Motorola? Listen to me. Where is Flavor Flav's watch? He needs one. Make it for him. It's true. Yeah, boy. Allie, do you want apps? I'm in the same boat as Peter. I don't really know if I want a wearable. But isn't that what people said when they announced the iPad? I don't know if I want a tablet. It's not about one. It's about, oh, look, shiny new tech. No, I wanted an iPad. I don't. It's one more thing for me to have to worry about charging. You know? It, I don't know. I'm not convinced. I had a Pebble. I have this Samsung thing here that pairs with my phone, supposedly, and... Yeah, I I don't remember to wear it. So. You know, it's it's been more than a decade since I've nor since I've regularly worn a wristwatch. It's just yeah. not part of my accoutrement anymore. I just, you know, I don't care. You know, I I keep my earrings in. I keep my my you know my chains on, but I just I've gotten really out of the habit of of wearing a watch, and I don't know if I really want to go back to that. And I don't really like doing it, like, when I'm typing, I take it off because it hurts my wrist. Any watch always has. And that's what I would do with my Pebble. I would take it off when I was typing, and then I would forget to put it back on, and it would sit on my desk for months on end collecting dust, and it would die. So I'm afraid that that's what would happen with me with any wearable. Peter wants what Jason Snell wants, and that's uh, an Apple hat. An Apple hat. No, an Apple yarmulke would be fine. <laughs> an Apple yarmulke. Well, they're going to have somewhere to put the storage, so it'll be one with a propeller on, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to take another quick break, and I'm going to tell you about NatureBox. Now, I had a chance to try these uh, when they were a sponsor on MacBreak Weekly, and they are, I'm not going to lie, totally and utterly delicious. They're snacks, um, but they're an awesome way to snack. If you, I said this before. You go to, uh, we call them depeners here. You can make fun of that name. I think you guys call them Quickie Marts or 7-Elevens or convenience stores or something. But you go in there, and they have the same old snacks that they've had since your grandparents went in there. They are shades of orange and green that w- that never intended to be, you know, they never grew out of nature. I don't know where they got those colors from. Probably meteorites or something, as far as I can tell. And they're just, they're old, they're stale, they're dry, they're monotonous, they're boring. There's two words that mean the same thing. Whatever that is, those are what you get. Normally, Nature Box is not that. They always have new stuff. They always have interesting stuff. They have... It's, so let me just explain how it works. Let me back up for a second. You subscribe. It's almost like a snack of the month club. You subscribe to Nature Box, and then every month they ship you a new box. And the really cool thing about it is you can choose the kinds of boxes that you get. I have to just uh, change the screen here for a second because I got diverted to the Canadian Nature Box. I don't want to give you predictions that are based far too much on Maple. But if I look at what they've got right now, I'm going to go to the snacks page. So... Right now, they have Asiago and cheddar cheese chips, ancient grains granola, apple cinnamon crave, Santa Fe corn sticks, flax fortune coins. I mean, this stuff, it's, it's just terrific. Uh, the only problem is deciding which one to eat first and how much of it to eat. Now, the cool thing about this, too, and I'm just going to go right back here for a second, is that, like I said, they ship it right to you. You always get fresh, new, interesting things. And... Frankly, uh, if you're watching, like I watch the UFC, if you're watching sporting events, if you're watching TV shows, it's just way better than eating the old junk that you always used to eat. 
So here's what you can do. Here's what I want you to do. You can start your NatureBlock membership today and get a free sample box. So you just go there. You go to naturebox.com slash imore to get started. That's naturebox.com slash I-M-O-R-E. Sign up. Get a free box. Try it out. If it is not delicious, if it is not to your liking, then don't do anything else. But if it is, if it is as good as I have told you it is, if it is as good as I believe you will find it to be, then just sign up, naturebox.com slash imore, and enjoy snacks shipped right to your door that will make your friends and family jealous. And you can tell them to go sign up too. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about our plans uh, for this event because uh, we're going to do some fun stuff. So this is all subject to change because we don't know everything that's going to happen just yet. But as far as I know now, I'm leaving Sunday night. I'll be in Cupertino Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I fly back on Thursday. The event is at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern uh, in Cupertino. They're not holding it at Moscone in San Francisco. They're not holding it at Yerba Buena. Uh, as we said earlier, this is a 2,000-seat facility. This is a big place, uh, and Apple is building onto it. So it's going to be a big event. We're going to have all the coverage that you expect leading up to it. We've done a lot of iOS 8 previews done a bunch of iPhone previews, iWatch previews. We're going to keep doing that. Uh, we're going to give you a full preview for what we think the event's going to hold. That should be up this weekend. Then during the event, I'm going to be live blogging from uh, the Flint Center. Uh, Peter is, is, is going to be backing me up here at home base. I'm not sure if you've decided whether you're going to be live during the show or not, Peter, but we'll let people know when, when you do. Yes. Yeah, so it could be Peter. Kevin Mitchell -Luck might help us. He's a huge watch aficionado. Uh, Ali's going to be uh, working on it. We're going to have the entire Mobile Nations news team bringing you everything you need to know as soon as, you know, immediately as it happens. It's going to be a big group effort on all of our part. Uh, I'm looking, I'm excited about it because yeah, I'm getting this vibe. Like, Peter, do you remember before WWDC where people we sort of knew about in the industry and, you know, who were working on this stuff were so excited about what they were going to show us? Hmm. Like they kind of, they knew about Swift, they knew about all the iOS 8 developer stuff, they knew about extensibility. They couldn't say anything, but you could just sort of see everyone happy and smiling. Yeah, WWDC 2014 was was um, a really interesting uh, keynote, uh, simply because everybody was so upbeat, so on message, and had so much to talk about. I would have to go back years uh, to find anything that was comparable to that. Um, so yeah, this is this is going to be an interesting event. Yeah, and if anything, and I don't want to oversell it, I don't want to you know, create my own expectational debt, but everyone I've spoken to is just as excited, just the same, we can't wait to show you this stuff. And yeah, they're excited every year for the iPhone, but like WWC this year, this year feels like something special. And I think there's a lot of pent-up interest because some people have been waiting for a bigger iPhone for a long time. A lot of people who aren't on the beta have been waiting for iOS 8. They've been waiting for the functionality, like extensibility, that it's going to provide. Extensibility, I mean, we've talked about it a lot. I've written, I think, 10,000 words on it, but it is going to be a big deal. We're going to have widgets. We're going to have... Uh, custom actions, custom sharing, custom keyboards. Um, we've seen some of that. Like we've seen some of the the Swift key, some of the Flexi, some of the uh, Swipe stuff that's coming out. One Password has been teasing their extension. I'm running the beta, and to be able to just like you go to a web page or an app, and as long as the extension is accessible, you just tap it, tap your thumb, and it fills in your password. It's, it, I'm not going to say it's an iPhone from the future. I'm not going to do that, but it definitely feels better than the iPhone I had, you know, three months ago. And I think people have been waiting for certain things to come to the iPhone for a long time, and they're going to be getting it this time, and they're going to be super happy about it. It's my quick take. All right, so uh, that is our quick plan. After that, I don't know what's going to happen exactly. It depends on what Apple does. If we have to do, if for example, in the Fleet Center extension, it's a maze, and you have to find your way through just to survive, <laughs> it might take me a little while to navigate that. Um, you know, whatever the Minotaur uh, happens to be. Uh, but we will do the I'm More show. Instead of doing it next Thursday, we're going to do it next Tuesday. That's the current plan, at least. So I don't know what the time will be like, because I don't know what time I'll finish at the event and what time we'll all finish writing about it. But sometime late afternoon, evening, we're going to do the next um, I'm More show after the event. We're also going to try and do another debug uh, developers panel. I really love the one we did after WWDC with Daniel Jalkut, Matt Drantz, and um, Ryan Nielsen. Uh, and Jason Snell, so I really want to do that again. We're going to do a uh, iterate designers panel, so we're going to talk a lot about how you make apps for the bigger screen uh, and what the repercussions are for designers. Uh, we'll do a vector probably the day before just to talk about the mobile payments some more. But it it is going to be a long day, but I think it is going to be a good day. That's my quick take. 
I keep saying that. Peter, I, I, I'm in this position where I'm so excited but so tired. Yeah, you've got to get yourself some uh, some rest before uh, before next week, man, because it's going to be a long week. I've got to be like Hicks and Gracie under a waterfall. <laughs> now there's an image. All right, so Peter, you not safe for work again this this week? Yes, indeed, working on it now. Uh, what was last week's? I, I it, it's been so long already. God, you know what? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, Me too. What, you, you what got, was last week's? Good grief! You've got one prep for this week. Kremlinology. Oh, Kremlinology. That's right. that's right. Yeah, because it was in reaction to the uh, the Apple invitation. You know, every every time an Apple invite to an Apple event like WWDC or next week's event goes out, people have to dissect the. Um, and thank you, Allie, for <laughs> reminding me. Uh, people have to. Uh, uh, dissect the uh, the invitation pixel by pixel to figure out the hidden meaning. And what it usually does is it it, it demonstrates what what they're hoping um, to see at these events. And if uh, they do somehow manage to guess them, well, then they declare that their their uh, observational skills were uh, were excellent. And of course, I was right. Well, no, you weren't. You were just lucky, or you were basing it off of. Uh, rumors that have been reported a million times in a million different places. So um, uh, I, I think that uh, um, uh, people need to lay off it a little bit. But I would still encourage people who read the uh, the, the column to uh, come up with their most wild, outlandish ideas for what each pixel of the uh, the invitation meant. And yes, I'm working on a new one for this week too. Um, Plus, have it up for you on Saturday. Brezhnev. Brezhnev. Brezhnev, yes. That was your idea, Renee. Thank you very much for that. Oh, I, wish I, sure. I wish I could have found a good picture that I really wanted to use of Brezhnev in a furry hat, though. Oh, that would have been great. Ali, you told everybody um, if you if you are going to uh, to nudie, how to nudie safely on the iPhone? I did. I gave you some apps that are probably a better idea than letting photos go to your photo stream. So what is what is your what are your picks? Oh, I think Snapchat was in there, obviously. Oh, no, Snapchat, find... like I wouldn't recommend it if you're if you have a single person you want to exchange with, just because Snapchat has issues of its own. But if you're looking for people, it has such a big community that you have to include it. Yeah, and I think what else did I have in there? I you think... had Dust, that new one by Mark. Wait, what's his name? Uh, sorry, you had Citcher, Avocado, which my friend Leo Laporte admitted to using, along with another app called Couple, I think. Yeah, Avocado is more for just couples, so if you just want to have an app that you can kind of keep schedules with and send photos, the nice thing about Avocado is I'm pretty sure that app does not save photos that you take with the app to your camera roll. And I think nice. it's one of the only few that do that. So, But for some yeah. people, that's obviously only going to work if you're only sending photos to one person. On Vector last week, Dave Wiskus, um, uh, one of the co-hosts and the guy who makes uh, Vesper, he was saying that he would like for Apple to have a private camera mode, just like you have a private browsing mode. So that if you want to be absolutely sure that the photo you take is never going to end up online, um, you switch to private camera mode, take the picture, and then when you want to go back to normal, switch back. And that combined with iOS 8, iOS 8 is already doing ephemeral photos. Like if you don't press a button, it disappears, I think, two minutes after you've seen it. I think it would make a lot of people safer because things would only end up online if you really intentionally wanted them to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. But for now, you can check out some of those, and those are obviously a little bit safer. Some of them offer encryption and self-destructing chats and all kinds of stuff. Including Mark Cuban's CyberDust. Yes. Uh, you also told people how to use two-factor authentication. And it's worth pointing out, Apple's two-factor authentication only protects iTunes purchases, changes to your account, and I think one other thing right now. There's some rumors that they're going to be rolling that out wider, and I really hope that they do. Um, but if even that protection is better than none, so you have a full set of instructions, I, I yeah, believe I have today. I would really like to see two-factor, because right now I, I actually tested this yesterday because I didn't remember whether or not it worked. If I sign into a device that I've never signed into before with my iCloud ID or restore from it, I will receive an email saying that I signed into a new device, but nothing stops me from doing that. Um, I know that when you set up brand new, I believe it asks you for your little code. That's only for iCloud Keychain, I think. Yeah, and it's only for iCloud Keychain. So that would be nice. I, I would like that at least extended to where I can't 
bring down an iCloud backup without either knowing that code or a recovery key or having something sent to another device before I can continue with a restore. All right, so we got a few. Was there anything else that you wanted to mention that you wrote about this week, Allie? Anything else come to mind? I think we posted our uh, how to sell your iPhone guide. Oh, yeah. So if you want to sell your iPhone uh, in order to help subsidize your iPhone 6, Allie's got a great guide for you. Yep. And we also put up the ultimate guide to accessibility on the iPhone. Ali went through and documented the entire stack of accessibility features. And they're really, I mean, there is so much in there. If you have visual impairments, audio impairments, motor skill or physical impairments, uh, learning impairments, you know, whether you have autism or dyslexia or you're nearsighted, if you're blind, if you're uh, hard of hearing, if you're deaf, there is a ton of stuff that Apple provides for you to be able to use not only your iPhone but exist better in the world around you. So uh, imore.com slash accessibility, you can find all that. I really liked how, you, how all that turned out, Ellie. It was good. Thanks. All right, questions. Um, from Salamore, it seems funny to me that Samsung in just one year has already released six smartwatches. Um, and so we get this a lot. How come Apple hasn't put out a watch yet? Samsung has already put out six watches. And my take is that these are fundamentally very different companies, but it's great that both exist. So uh, Samsung does what is essentially the Google version of public betas, except they do it in hardware. So instead of just putting up Gmail and leaving a beta tag on it for 20 years, they will start putting out watches immediately. They'll put out phablets immediately. Anything that they can think of, they'll start making it into products. They'll put it out. Maybe they sell, maybe they don't, but they learn. They put out new versions, and they try all sorts of crazy things. They just introduced a freaking phone with a a curved display that puts the notification center on one side for right-handed people only. I mean, this is this this is like literally that billionaire crazy uncle of yours who can build anything he wants in his backyard. It's Larry Ellis with a hardware division. It's amazing. Um, and they'll just try it, and once in a while something will stick. They'll have a good idea, and a lot of times they'll have you know kooky ideas that are utterly incoherent. But people who are early adopters who want, like if you wanted a smartwatch you, from Apple, you just couldn't get one, but you could get one from Samsung. So for people like that, it's great. And I think it benefits everybody because you can see what works and what doesn't. And, you know, Apple famously put up all of the bad uh, phones, like not bad phones, but all like the, the Blackberries and the Nokia communicators and the trios. And they said what they think, what they thought were the problem with those and how they were going to solve it. They talked about tablet PCs and what they thought the problem was with those and how they could solve it. Apple is great when it can see an existing product and say, you know, this is not a great experience, but we think we can make it better. We think we have something to offer, something to add here. And Samsung is part of the reason that Apple can look at the smartwatch community and say, we think we have something of value to give to this. So, um, I mean, do either of you have any concerns about Samsung? I mean, they're a big company. They got money. You know, sometimes it just feels like throwing they're throwing stuff up on the wall and seeing what'll stick. It's exactly what they're doing. You know, it just it, 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 it's 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 a little crazy. Um, and hey, if they can make money doing that, then great. I, I'm not going to disparage Samsung's products, though. I use a Samsung TV. I've had yep. it for a few years. I'm very happy with it. I don't particularly care for their phones, but you know, whatever. It, to you know, different strokes for different folks. I just got my mom a Samsung TV mostly because you know I, I like plasmas. Plasmas are you know falling up. You know, they're 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 falling by the wayside. So we got her an LED, and it's hard to. I mean, Samsung, LG, Sharp. It's 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 not a big differentiated world anymore. It's basically a panel that you pump either your cable box or your Apple TV into. Mm-hmm. All right, so here is another. We've answered a bunch of these already. So I apologize if I don't pick your question exactly, but we've got a bunch of similar ones. Um, from Kyle, he wants to know, any thoughts on what devices will be supported for continuity? iPhone 5 and iPad mini? Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but it's anything with Bluetooth LE, which I think is the iPhone 4S, if not iPhone 4 on. Yeah, if I understand right, Bluetooth LE is the deciding factor. So um, that and you know a, a Mac that supports Bluetooth LE. Um, uh, Bluetooth 4.0 uh, should should be all that you should need. And iOS iOS 8 only starts in the iPhone 4s anyway, so um, my guess is that anything that supports iOS 8 will support continuity. iPhone mm -hmm. 4s and up. Yeah. Has Bluetooth LE. Uh, Nick says, uh, I think NFC will only support monetary transactions and not be as open as Android's implementation, extra buttons, etc. 
that wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if Apple used NFC for a very specific function. I mean, uh, this comes up too, and I have these discussions over and over again. You know, why doesn't Apple put in a second uh, radio so that Verizon can have simultaneous voice and data? It's because Verizon is one network, one stubborn, stubborn network in the entire world, and Apple is not going to throw out their power management and make their design more complicated just to support one network. Um, yeah, and people have made the excuse, well, other other phone companies or other uh, handset manufacturers have done it. Well, you know, if, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge is, is what I say to them, being the father of three. Uh, you know, just, just because other people have done a stupid, made a stupid design decision doesn't mean that Apple has to repeat their failures. The bottom line is Verizon is going to switch over to Volte, you know, and, and at that point it's, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, and I think Apple's content to, to have Verizon customers wait until then. And Verizon customers certainly don't seem to be, um, and Sprint customers for that matter, certainly don't seem to be not buying the iPhone in droves simply because exactly. they can't make a call and run data on it at the same time. Do your other friends need the marketing push that Verizon gives to those phones? Yeah. Maybe. Does the iPhone well, they make the specific, push? No. They make, often make specific models just for Verizon, which is something Apple's not prepared to do either anymore. Yeah, exactly. One, one phone to world them all. Five models, but one phone. So the NFC thing, it wouldn't surprise me if Apple is going to be hyper-conservative with NFC and only enable it. Like, Touch ID was only at, was for only two specific things for a year. Then the, AP, the API went wide. Apple is known to be conservative with radios and conservative with APIs. So my guess is if there is NFC, it will be specifically for the use in one or two functions, and then maybe a year or two from now, it'll get opened up for other functions. When Apple's has you know, hundreds of millions of data points to say what works, what doesn't, and what they need to do with it. Absolutely. Uh, lots of questions about 28 gigs we've already talked about, uh, splitting screen sizes into tiers we've already talked about. Um, does continuity work between an iPad and, say, an iPhone? Yes. So my the other day, when the po uh, last week when we were podcasting, in fact, my phone rang during the podcast, and I pressed the sleep button to mute it, and immediately across the room, my, my iPad started ringing. Uh, so this is the future we have coming for us. Yeah, that's not annoying. <laughs> so but the answer is yes. It'll continuity works between the iPhone and iPad and the iPhone and Mac. I, some of it will work between the iPad and the Mac, but for example, the SMS and phone stuff won't because there's, it needs an iPhone to relay that kind of stuff. I hope syncing with that sure works better than iMessage and FaceTime because there's times when I'll answer a FaceTime call on my phone and my iPad continues ringing. First nerd problems, Ali. <laughs> now I'm sure I'm sure there'll be all sorts of annoyances at first, and some of them will get fixed, and some won't. But if they were all fixed, we'd have very little to write about. Um, blah blah blah. Do you think the Apple? This is from Curtis. Do you think Apple will drop the price for iCloud storage, given that Dropbox finally has? I mean, I'd like them to. I think five gigabytes is too little for the free tier. I don't think it's too little. I think Apple could afford to be more generous with the free tier. We only know pricing for the what? Is it, two gigs. Uh, two gigabytes is a dollar um, a month, two? and two hundred gigabytes is four dollars a month. Is that right, Ellie? Oh my! I thought it was at ninety-nine cents for two hundred gigs. Apparently, I read that wrong. <laughs> no, no, you're right. So there's there's fifty gigs, five. There's five gigs for free, twenty gigs for a dollar, 200 gigs for four dollars. Yeah. Um, I would like to see that more. Drops out. I hope a terabyte comes out at 10 bucks a month. Yeah, there is a terabyte tier. We don't know the price yet, but I'm, I mean, it depends on how Apple doesn't traditionally make their money off services. So they do sometimes charge a premium for it, but I think that would be, they'd make more money. Um, I don't know. I'm not a, I, I shouldn't say something like that. I'm not a CEO. I don't run these companies. Given the price points of Dropbox and Google and OneDrive and all these different things, uh, I would say that cloud is becoming table stakes. Well, yeah. and Apple is using the cloud in a way now that's much different than they have in the past. Up until now, you really couldn't use iCloud like you will be able to with Yosemite and iOS 8, like a true cloud storage service. It was selective. It's not like you could go in and pull files and store things. So sure, they probably didn't make money off of that because I still had to rely on Dropbox to store files that I wanted to open across several different programs and be able to organize those as I wish. Yeah. Um, cheaper is better for us. I don't think it would hurt Apple at this point, but we'll have to wait and see. It, it is a brave new world out there for online storage. Peter, am I forgetting anything? Any awesome games I didn't ask you about? 
No, I can't think of anything that's really uh, burning up the charts uh, for me today. I have iPhone brain freeze. Just iPhone 6 brain event burn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Allie, anything on your end? Mm, uh, I think we... Well, I updated... Uh, Minion Rush has a lot of updates lately, so I went ahead and updated that game guide. So for anyone that's looking for new tips, new codes, those are all updated. Yeah, and Simon did Clash of Clans as well. Yes. All right, cool. Well, Peter, uh, Ali, thank you so much. We will be coming at you from the iPhone event or shortly thereafter next week. In the meantime, Peter, if people want to follow you, if they want to read more of your smart stuff, where can they go? They can uh, hit me up on Twitter at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H, and, of course, read my stuff at imore.com. Allie, how about you? Uh, every day on imore.com, and I am at imuggle on all of the things. I am at Rene Ritchie. If you uh, can join us live, I urge that you do. Normally, uh, next week will be an exception, but normally we are here every Thursday afternoon. Well, it depends on what time zone, but we're here every Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I think that works out to about 6 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, if you can join us live, because you can ask us all the questions that you heard us being asked today, or you can just hashtag Ask iMore on Twitter, and we'll keep track of it, or email us at podcast at imore.com. If, if you can't join us live, you can also find the audio version of the show on iTunes, and you can find the video version of it on YouTube. Peter Alley, thank you so much. I will see you at the event. See you soon. Well, Bye. I won't see you at the event, but you'll see everybody else will see you at the event. We will see all of each other at the event. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.